our self-image is smaller than our potential capacity. Our self-image is essentially smaller than it might be, for it is built up only of the group of cells that we have actually used. Further, the various patterns and combinations of cells are perhaps more important than their actual number. A man who has mastered several languages will make use both of more cells and more combinations of cells. Most children of minority population communities the world over know at least two languages. Their self-image is a little nearer the potential maximum than that of people who only know their mother tongue. It is the same in most other areas of activity. Our self-image is in general more limited and smaller than our potential. There are individuals who know from 30 to 70 languages. This indicates that the average self-image occupies only about 5% of its potential. Systematic observation and treatment of some thousands of individuals drawn from most nations and civilizations have convinced me that this figure is roughly the fraction we use of our total hidden potential. The achievement of immediate objectives of immediate objectives has a negative impact. Or <laughs> let me read that again. The subject heading is the achievement of immediate objectives has a negative aspect. The negative aspect of learning to achieve aims is that we tend to stop learning when we have mastered sufficient skills to attain our immediate objective. Thus, for instance, we improve our speech until we can make ourselves understood. But any person who wishes to speak with the clarity of an actor discovers that he must study speech for several years in order to achieve anything approaching his maximum potential in this direction. An intricate process of limiting ability accustoms man to make do with 5% of his potential without realizing that his development has been stunted. The complexity of the situation is brought about by the inherent interdependence between the growth and development of the individual and the culture and economy of the society in which he grows. Education is largely tied to prevailing circumstances. Nobody knows the purpose of life and the education that each generation passes on to the succeeding one is no more than a continuation of the habits of thought of the prevailing generation. Life has been a harsh struggle since the beginning of mankind. Nature is not kind to creatures lacking awareness. One cannot ignore the great social difficulties created by the existence of the many millions of people the earth has harbored in the past few centuries. Under such conditions of strain, education is improved only to the extent that is necessary and possible in order to bring up a new generation able to replace the old one under more or less similar conditions. Minimum development of the individual satisfies the needs of society. The basic biological tendency of any organism to grow and develop to its fullest extent has been largely governed by social and economic revolutions that improved living conditions for the majority and enabled greater numbers to reach a minimum of development. Under these conditions, basic potential development ceased in early adolescence because the demands of society enabled the members of the younger generation to be accepted as useful individuals at the minimum stage. Further training after adole early adolescence is in fact confined to the acquisition of practical and professional knowledge in some field. And basic development is continued only by chance and in exceptional cases. Only the unusual person will continue to improve his self-image until it more nearly approaches the potential ability inherent in each individual. The vicious circle of incomplete development 
and satisfaction with achievement. In light of the statements above, it becomes clear that most people do not achieve the use of more than a minute fraction of their potential ability. The minority that outstrips the majority does so not because of its higher potential, but because it learns to use a higher proportion of this potential that may well be no more than average. Taking into account, of course, that no two people share an identical natural ability. How is such a vicious circle created, which at one and the same time stunts men's powers, yet permits them to feel reasonably self-satisfied for all that they have limited themselves to, a small proportion of their capacities? It is a curious situation. The physiological processes that hamper development. In the first years of his life, man is similar to every other living being, mobilizing all his separate powers and using every function that is sufficiently developed. The cells of his body seek, like all living cells, to grow and to perform their specific functions. This applies equally to the cells of the nervous system. Each one lives its own life as a cell while participating in the organic function for which it exists. Nevertheless, many cells remain inactive as part of the total organism. This may be because of two different processes. In one, the organism may be occupied with actions that require the inhibition of certain cells and the necessary mobilization of others. If the body is occupied more or less continuously with such actions, then a number of cells will be in an almost constant state of inhibition. In the other case, some potential functions may not reach maturity at all. The organism may have no call to practice them, either because it sets no value on them as such, or because its drives lead it in a different direction. Both of these processes are common. And indeed, social conditions allow an organism to function as a useful member of society without in the least developing its capacities to the full. Man judges himself in accordance with his value to society. The general tendency towards social improvement in our day has led directly to a disregard rising to neglect for the human material of which society is built. The fault lies not in the goal itself, which is constructive in the main, but in the fact that individuals, rightly or wrongly, tend to identify their self-images with their value to society. Even if he has emancipated himself from his educators and protectors, Man does not strive to make himself any different from the pattern impressed upon him from the outset. In this way, society comes to be made up of persons increasingly alike in their ways, behaviors, and aims. Despite the fact that the inherited differences between people are obvious, there are few individuals who view themselves without reference to the value attributed to them by society. Like a man trying to force a square peg into a round hole, so the individual tries to smooth out his biological peculiarities by alienating himself from his inherent needs. He strains to fit himself into the round hole that he now actively desires to fill, for if he fails in this, his value will be so diminished in his own eyes as to discourage further initiative. These considerations must be borne in mind to appreciate fully the overwhelming influence of the individual's attitude towards himself once he again seeks to foster his own growth, that is, to allow his specific qualities to develop and reach fruition. Judging a child by his achievements robs him of spontaneity. During his early years, a child is valued, by and large, not for his achievements, but simply for himself. In families where this is the case, 
the child will develop in accordance with his individual abilities. In families where children are judged primarily by their achievements, all spontaneity will disappear at an early age. These children will become adults without experiencing adolescence. Such adults may from time to time feel an unconscious longing for the adolescence they have missed, a desire to seek out those instinctive capacities within themselves that were denied their youthful will to develop. Self-improvement is linked to recognition of the value of the self. It is important to understand that if a man wishes to improve his self-image, he must first of all learn to value himself as an individual, even if his faults as a member of society appear to him to outweigh his qualities. We may learn from persons crippled from birth or childhood how an individual may view himself in the face of obvious shortcomings. Those who succeed at looking at themselves with a sufficient encompassing humanity to achieve stable self-respect respect, may reach the heights that the normally healthy will never achieve. But those who consider themselves inferior because of their disabilities and overcome them by sheer willpower tend to grow into hard and embittered adults who will take revenge upon fellow men who are not at fault, and moreover, who may not be able to change the circumstances even if they wished to do so. <clears throat> 